in, in the break, uh, I asked Marcel what, what I should say about uh, SpeedMS right now. And uh, with a, um, amazing simplicity, he said, uh, we are the, the best fund in the world. I, I did double check that on the Crunchbase, and then you are actually the 89th uh, according to the Crunchbase. But, but yeah, that's, that's not a, you know, it's two digits, so it's not that bad. And actually, um, you have nine exits, which is uh, not bad for, um, uh, for a European VC. And um, I think the, the more uh, KPIs will, will follow and stories. Um, so uh, give a big hand uh, to, to Marcel. Um, before we get started, um, maybe a show of hands. How many startups are here? And how many VCs? Yeah, almost 50-50, I guess. Um, so I've kind of taken a, taken a perspective of the of the founders because at the end of the day, the, you know, they do uh, most of the heavy lifting, and, and we're just there to help. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, why. Would anybody enter the U.S. market? I think that's typically, at least intuitively, pretty clear. But we can we can try to quantify that a little bit. Uh, uh, how? Once you get there, how do you stay there, and how do you become successful? That's that's not easy. And we've heard some examples where it has worked really well. I'm going to share some examples where it has worked as well. I've called it "Tales of the Unexpected." Uh, that's probably not the right title because you know it's not unexpected. Whenever we uh, have companies go to the as they expect to be successful, and we think they can be. Uh, so rather, these are amazing stories, although the way these companies become successful uh, has a lot of uh, unexpected turns and twists uh, in their journey. So maybe uh, maybe actually talk a little bit about myself. I'm a partner at Speed Invest. I joined the company six years ago. Uh, before that, I had a career in enterprise software, moved from technology, product, into, uh, into sales and business development. Um, and I joined six years ago. I moved straight to our Silicon Valley office. Uh, so we've had an office in Silicon Valley uh, from the beginning, 2011, when we started. And I spent almost six years there, and I just moved back to Europe a couple of months ago, uh, meaning I'm new in, in the European venture ecosystem to some extent. So a lot of this is... Uh, a lot of people that I see here are, are uh, you know, new to me. Uh, so we want to be the preferred partner for founders. Uh, obviously, we provide funding. Uh, we were a seed fund, so our tickets, initial tickets, are between 500,000 and a million. Um, but we operationally support uh, our startups, uh, our European startups. We invest only in Europe, um, meaning we have a large team uh, relative to the size of the fund. We have 70 people in the fund. Uh, a third of those are exclusively there to support startups in many different roles on the HR side, hiring side, marketing, business development, corporate development, M&A. So we have a very large bench of people. Uh, and you could compare us to Andreessen Horowitz, uh, first round capital in the US, similar types of platform VCs. Uh, Project A in Germany uh, is similar. Uh, and we, we like to invest in European startups that have global ambitions. We like to build global uh, companies at the end of the day. Um, this is us by the numbers. Uh, I haven't put here how many in, uh, exits we have. We are actually more than nine. In our first fund, we've made 20 investments. We have 11 exits at the moment, uh, two write-offs, and the rest is still, uh, still moving. Uh, in our second fund, we have some early exits, um, not major ones, um, but we're quite pleased with how things are going. Um, as I said, we have 70 people on the payroll. Uh, we're headquartered in Vienna, um, so we have uh, certainly at the beginning of our existence a big focus on Central and Eastern Europe, and right now we're spread out across Europe in Munich, Berlin, and London. We have some people in Moscow even, uh, and Silicon Valley uh, was you know, from the beginning um, a focus for us. So let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about why would you enter the U.S. market. Uh, obviously, it, it's a very large market. Um, I run our technology enterprise team. Um, and so especially in that, in that space, uh, the U.S., and I really talk about Silicon Valley, to be honest, has a lot of early adopter customers. Um, but from a, from a venture perspective, from a fundraising perspective, uh, Silicon Valley is very interesting. The U.S. is very interesting. First of all, there's a lot, uh, you know, the, the sizes of the rounds are bigger. If you're a founder or an investor, uh, if you, you know, uh, Ennis talked about uh, geo-arbitrage, 
And this is true. If you take a company out of Hungary, you drop it in Silicon Valley, that same company with the same team, the same revenue, and the same customers, it's probably going to be twice, uh, increased twice in, in valuation. You'll be able, if you can raise in, in Silicon Valley, you'll be able to raise bigger rounds at higher valuations, but also from an exit perspective, the US, uh, the US market is just many, many times bigger. Obviously, in, in total, the amount of exits in the US, but also the size of the exits is you know, three to four X in, in, uh, in the US. So many quantitative reasons uh, to move to the US. Uh, what I actually find interesting is that if you look at the VC investment per capita, so per inhabitant, uh, the US really exceeds uh, Europe by, by far. Uh, and then you have to think about the amount of public money that is being invested in startups in Europe whereas it's mainly private money in the US. Uh, and you can see that there's just a, a large imbalance, although Europe is catching up. So um, you know, let's say you've moved to the US, um, and then you know, you're there, you've landed, uh, you start your fundraising. There is an expectation that, uh, as, especially in early stages, you'll be able to raise from US VCs easily. Um, the reality is, and this is what we've painfully uh, experienced and learned in the last you know, nine years or so, is really hard for early stage companies to raise in the US. US VCs in general are really not interested in you, know, you as a Hungarian or an Austrian or a German founder, no matter how cool your technology is, you know, even if you have some nice traction, they just don't care. Uh, they invest locally. Um, and, and that's just the reality. Um, so what you need, uh, what we see in our portfolio, our portfolio companies are able to raise out of the US when they are Series B, realistically. You know, Series A, sometimes the US VCs will take your call. Uh, they will agree to a meeting, but actually raising a round is not gonna happen before you get to that, that stage. Um, European VCs, by contrast, if you, you know, if you settle down in the US and you have some customers and some traction there, they really love this. Um, so if you're a company, you go to the US in the seed stage, you get a couple of US customers, you, know, you sign them up, you get some revenue, you continue to grow in Europe as well. They love this because a Series A investor or even a Series B investor, when they come in, you know, part of that money, part of the capital that they invest is going to be to expand internationally. And if you're a technology company, US is a very uh, uh, um, logical first step. If you already can demonstrate that you have traction, that customers like your product, that they stay on your, your platform, that is a big plus. That is de-risks the deal for them uh, very substantially. And we've seen this uh, with one of our companies, uh, Bitmovin, who moved to the US. You know, they, they weren't necessarily very large, they weren't necessarily growing exceptionally fast, but they had really good traction in the US, and that for Atomico was one of the reasons to actually uh, write quite a, quite a large ticket um, in, a, in a 10 million Euro, uh, US uh, million round. European customers love it too. If you are a European company, you're trying to sell in, in Europe, if you can show you have, you know, good uh, refer referenceable customers in the US, that's a big plus for them and it will help you on the traction side um, in Europe too. So while this may not be your, uh, you know, your, your immediate reason to go to the US as a founder, uh, this may be a side effect of you know, uh, being in the US and, and getting some early traction. Now the US of course is great. Um, but you know, there's areas where Europe leads, and um, this is, these are areas that, that founders can capitalize on. Um, first of all, as I mentioned, uh, Europe's been growing quite fast. The amount of money available in Europe uh, has, has grown uh, really fast. You know, I think last year, 23 billion was invested, up from 5 million a couple of years ago. So that's a very, uh, very fast acceleration, meaning there's a lot of money in the market. And that should translate into an easier fundraising process for founders. Unfortunately for us as an investor, uh, and for some of you, I guess, it translates into bigger rounds and higher valuations. Um, but that's you know, uh, part, part of the playing the game. Um, but Europe definitely has a great talent, uh, a lot of developers. Um, if you look at the number of you know, science, technology, PhDs in Europe, it's almost twice uh, the amount uh, in the US. And so there's really a, 
and, and this is what US VCs also recognize actually, there's a competitive advantage of having your development in Europe, you know, let's say in Hungary or Romania or Poland or wherever. Um, and that's something you should, you, know, uh, you should use as a founder. So there's some good news there as well. And, uh, and I think we, we've saw some examples before. You know, there are a lot of Eurocorns. Um, there were 61, 17 were added in 2018, some of them from CEE. So you don't have to go to the US per se um, to, raise, uh, to raise money or to actually build a big company. At some point, you of course have to because it's a large market, but uh, you can really grow these companies quite large uh, even in Europe and even by staying in Europe. So let's, let's assume you've, you've made the decision, you're, you're here, you're on a plane to San Francisco, you've, you have, you've packed your bags, maybe you're shipping some, some, some furniture. Um, maybe one thing, like a practical uh, thing to consider when you're moving to the US, uh, or even when you're not yet moving to the US, flip your company into a US entity. Um, and it's mentioned that US investors are comfortable investing in European uh, companies. Um, that's not really our experience. I think it's difficult, especially for early stage in any case, and being a European company just complicates matters. Um, if you look at a US contract, an investment agreement uh, relative to a German one or an Austrian one, um, I don't know about, about Hungary, it's, it's you know, 10 times larger, it's much more complex. Uh, they just don't understand it. There's a lot of things they have to figure out. And so if you can simplify that part of the process, uh, I think that's a good thing to do. Um, in some cases, there's tax reasons to flip a company early, uh, expatriation tax, for example. And so we've had situations where founders wanted to flip the company late and they you know, uh, struggled to deal with the tax implications of that. Um, so if you, if you have your site set on the US, uh, you might as well flip your company uh, to a US company uh, sooner rather than later. In our experience, European uh, funds are quite comfortable investing in US entities, of course, certainly when there's US, uh, European founders. So that, that as, a, as a side point. Uh, there might actually also be reasons not to do this, by the way, if you're dependent on grants, on local grants. If you expect to raise from local funds that cannot invest outside of a region or a country, this is a reason not to do this, but it's something to think about. So you've landed in San Francisco. Uh, you've moved into your you know, sharing flat with your four other flatmates, paying 10 times the rent you're paying in your hometown. Uh, what next? How do you stay in the US? How do you become successful in the US? Um, for me, there's kind of two factors here. Um, one is what I, you know, what I can call the soft factors. This is really about the founders and what they need to do to get there. Um, and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, so first of all, when, you, when you're in, in Silicon Valley, you have to think global. And obviously, you're going there because you're thinking global. But really, when you're there, it's, uh, it's actually amazing how diverse Silicon Valley is. Uh, when, when we moved there, I moved into a small town where 70% of the, the population was, were Asian. Uh, the next town, 70% were uh, Hispanics. And the other town, 70% were Indian. I'm not trying to make a racial point here, but it's an extremely diverse, uh, uh, diverse environment. Everybody is from somewhere. There's very few people that are actually from Silicon Valley. And so everybody comes from somewhere. It's a total melting pot. Um, and you just have to, have to fit in. And so think global, but uh, act local and, and blend into that, that environment. Um, if, if need be, you have to adjust your, your ambition level. Everybody goes to Silicon Valley, and as I mentioned, you know, everybody's from somewhere. People, you know, most people have moved there, and they've moved there for a reason, and that is to become very successful and you know, globally recognized as you know, a founder of a big company or you know, a big investor or whatever. Um, but everybody has super high ambition levels. Everybody you know, is going for the moonshots, and investors expect that sort of attitude. Investors in the US compared to, to, to Europe sometimes, they really go for these moonshots. They are not interested in whether you're cash flow positive in 18 months from now. You know, they want you to burn a lot of money, but grow very fast. And so that's a mindset you need to have. You need to communicate in a very, you know, 
what for most Europeans feels like an overly aggressive or ambitious or bragging type, type of communication style. This is how it works, this is what people want to see, and if you want to raise money in, in the US, or even if you sell in the US, you have to be fairly aggressive. Um, Silicon Valley has the opportunities to deliver these types of ambitions, um, and you know, I always say, your talent is everywhere, but uh, opportunity is not evenly distributed, and there's a lot of opportunity in Silicon Valley. So lastly, when you, uh, when you get there, um, you know, for most people, it's kind of an all or nothing attitude. Uh, obviously, you know, it's, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that you should, you know, go to move, you know, pack up all your things and move to Silicon Valley while you've never been there. I think it's good to spend time there and, and, and check out the scene and so forth and understand the opportunities. And this is what we try to do with our office in Silicon Valley to help founders understand what the opportunities are. But at some point, uh, you know, you have to decide if you're on the bus or off the bus. Um, moving to Silicon Valley when you're not really on the bus uh, is, is usually a bad idea. And it's, you know, it's, it's not going to allow you to make the investments in time and effort uh, to be successful. And, and it's not going to be a happy ending for, for, for all involved. Um, and this is tough, especially for founders, because, you know, you typically end up burning some bridges. You know, you're, I don't know, you're, you're, you have your lifestyle in, in your hometown, you have your friends, your family, you have your house, maybe you have a relationship. Um, when you move to Silicon Valley, are you, are you, you know, what happens to that relationship? And we've seen many founders that move to Silicon Valley and you have the relationship breaking up and all sorts of drama, sometimes they move back. And so there's a lot of sacrifice that these founders go through, uh, not just on the, in terms of where they spend their time, but also in terms of their, you know, their personal life. You know, being alone, we saw the picture of this lonely guy, uh, you know, on, near the Golden Gate Bridge, and it will feel like that at some points. Um, but when you get there, so you know, get on the bus and, and totally immerse yourself in the local local community. Silicon Valley is a very, and Americans in general are very chatty, very approachable. Um, and there's a story of a guy called Andrew Chen, who's now with Andreessen Horowitz, used to be at Uber, head of growth, and uh, we, we've known him uh, for a while. And he said, and he wrote in a blog as well, when, when he moved to Silicon Valley, he you know, decided to meet you know, one new person every day uh, for a year. And I think that's actually a very practical, very good approach. It's, I tried to do something similar when I moved to, when I moved to Silicon Valley. But that means that you know, at, after a year, you have 365 you know, contacts. Let's say 10% are you know, uh, you stay in touch. You know, that's somewhat of a, of a uh, you know, eco, little ecosystem you build around yourself. So just immerse yourself into that, jump into that. Uh, 500 startups, for example, is a great way to you know, become part of a bigger family. Uh, we, we are fairly successful in getting our companies into Y Combinator, which is another community of founders and, and you know, investors as well, uh, which is a great home for you know, uh, European founders moving to the US. Now, staying in the US, there's you know, some other things, you know, the blocking and tackling, the, the tactical stuff, uh, the, the do's and don'ts, if you want. Um, and you know, I've mentioned it before, uh, people are very accessible in the U.S. It's really easy, uh, and, and you know, I wrote this down from a sales perspective. It's really relatively easy to get in touch with a fairly senior person, you know, in a, a company that you think can be a potential customer, and actually get a meeting or a call with them. Um, you know, high high uh, executives. They're actually, whereas in Europe, executives tend to be, you know, they don't want to waste time with startups. They don't want to be seen as wasting time with startups. In the U.S., it's completely different. If you are running, you know, a sizable part of Google or Facebook or whatever, you are expected to stay in touch with what startups are doing in your space. And if you're not, you're at risk of missing the boat. And it's actually a, a negative thing in terms of how you know, people perceive you. So... This is something you can totally use. That first meeting, that first call, people getting back, responding to an email, that's usually quite uh, relatively easy. The difficult part, um, as in Europe, is staying engaged with that customer, getting them to respond, getting them to agree to next steps. Um, and you know, I think sometimes European founders tend to be a little bit uh, passive, if you want. 
uh, you can be very aggressive. You can really push people multiple times by email. Hey, you know, we spoke. I haven't heard back. You haven't heard back. Uh, this is what you Americans expect, and they will not get mad. Uh, and if they get annoyed, they will tell you. And this is a good time to stop <laughs> and, and find another way to, you know, stay connected with that potential customer, I don't know, through a newsletter or something else. Um, but bottom line is, you know, you can, you can get quick yeses, you can be aggressive, and people expect you to be. Uh, culturally, there's, you know, maybe one thing to watch out for a little bit. Um, you know, we've, and I've experienced this myself, you go into a meeting, everything's great, they love the product, they love the technology, they love the team, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and this is fantastic, this is interesting, let's meet again, my friend, this and that, blah, blah, blah. End of the day, nothing happens. So, you know, Americans tend to communicate, uh, you know, a li little bit more positive than most Europeans. And so when they say, hey, let's, this is great, let's meet again, what they're saying, well, this is interesting, you know, I might, I might run into you again, but there's really no need for follow-up. And so that takes a little bit of getting used to because you know, it's obviously pretty depressing if you run into this situation a few times and turns out not what you expect it to be. So let's maybe uh, wrap up with a few, uh, a few examples of companies that we invested in, some from CE, some not, uh, that moved to the US and, uh, and actually became successful there. And I think we, we have Mark here in the room from Avatau, a Hungarian company, um, which we liked a lot. Obviously, they had a very strong team, very technology uh, skilled team from, from you know, Crisis, Budapest University, people in Berkeley. Um, we, you know, we saw this as being a global opportunity, of course. It's a SaaS play and, and you know, security, security is a concern for every company on this planet. And so it's truly a global opportunity. And we especially saw an opportunity in the US where, again, you know, this, this is where you can probably find good early adopters and, and a huge market as well. Um, so today, we're kind of in the process of moving into the US. I guess we're working on US market development. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, what we've done with them, we've surveyed their initial customers, try to get some market feedback, understand what the requirements are, because the requirements of a U.S. customer uh, can be very different from the requirements in your local market, right? In your local market, you know the people well, they're prepared to, you know, maybe not look at, I don't know, things like usability or product quality, you know, as close as a, as a U.S. customer, which is, you know, a totally different customer. Plus, you, you know, you have to kind of cross that chasm from early adopters to mainstream players, which means you really have to have a product uh, that is very usable. Um, so we're right now in this process. We're trying to get some good advisors for the company. We're trying to help them land the first U.S. customers. Assuming all of this works well, we'll see where that ends, whether they can raise in the U.S. Uh, or will raise in, in Europe. But we want to be able to get the company in a position where they can go to a Series A investor and say, hey, we have good traction in the US, you know, here are the proof points, here's how we do it, and this is how we scale it. Um, so very exciting opportunity we're working on right now. Last, last example, uh, I think this is a good example of a founder that's on the bus, um, Ina from Scalar. Uh, built uh, a solution to detect and prevent uh, download fraud for apps. And she's working mainly with, with gaming companies, uh, had a you know, very good growth in the last year, uh, really wrapping up the, the, the local market, which for her is the CIS market, uh, moving into the Nordics. But she has her sights set on, on, on Silicon Valley, where obviously there's a you know, few very large gaming players. Um, she's been traveling there frequently, starting to connect with these companies, starting to build pilots. Um, she's actually having a baby now, which is the reason why she's not in Silicon Valley. Um, but sh you know, the plan is for her to move to Silicon Valley, uh, initially 50%, and then grow that over time. She's already hired a team there, so it's like she's completely focused and she knows that that's where, uh, you know, where her big opportunity is and she does what it takes to get there. Um, again, we'll have to see how this plays out, uh, but this could be exit number nine, uh, sorry, number 10, hopefully. I think that's it from my side. Uh, I suppose we have some time for questions. Yes. Well, you just, uh, you just told stories about that, that the founders uh, 
uh, sometimes move or they have to move to, to the Silicon Valley with family, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, if you open up the media or LinkedIn, then you will uh, read a lot about work-life balance. So if I may ask about startups, work-life balance, so what's, what's your view, what's Speed Invest's view on that? Well, I think if you're a founder, especially in the early stage, there is no such thing, right? I mean, there, I think what's important is to you know, keep your sanity, uh, you know, keep your health, uh, keep your sanity. So in that sense, work-life balance is important. You know, you need to be able to rest and you need to be able to relax and you need to be able to think ahead and not just like chase, uh, you know, chase many different, you know, trying to f fire fight many different fires. But it's tough, and I think it's tough in Europe, and I think it's tough in the U.S. And U.S., you know, you have the complication of being in a in a in an environment that you don't know with different rules and I don't know, tax rules, immigration rules. You know, how do I get a banker? I mean, there's many of these kind of practical points uh, that doesn't help. But uh, yeah, it's it's tough. <laughs> yeah. uh, last quick question. Uh, today I just saw a, a blog post about. Uh, how to how to run or how to manage your company uh, with daily one hour work from from Bali or, or I don't know uh, some some island. So would you invest in in, in such company? Because there in the blog post uh, it, it was it was summarized that they have so good processes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the founder uh, doesn't have to work just one hour per per day. No, I don't think I would invest. I think I would I think I would move there actually. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Marcel. Uh, gentlemen, big applause.